Hello and welcome to today's presentation. I am Diane Okonski, President of the Icelandic National League of the United States, and I'm very happy to have you join us today. Before we get started, I just have a couple of logistical things to talk about. Um, as a, attendees to this program, you are on mute. However, we do welcome questions and we'll answer as many as possible later in the program. If you are uh, using a PC, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you are on a phone or a tablet, the button may be in the upper right corner or you may even have to swipe to find it. Um, also, this program is being recorded and will be available through the INL US website, www.inlus.org. So today we are thrilled to have with us Rhonda Adkins, chef, professional food photographer and freelance writer. Rhonda grew up as a Navy brat and then spent 22 years in the Air Force and has toured the world. Passionate about all aspects of food, she became a master gardener level three, which is organic, and now runs a cooking school, manages an international market, and manages a take and go deli in Great, in Great Falls, Montana. She lives and breathes food. Rhonda's experiences traveling and living all over the world have influenced her cooking and images of food, people, places, events, and objects. You can find her work in many online and printed publications. Rhonda is a graduate of the Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts, the Rocky Mountain School of Photography, and Southern Illinois University, where she received a BA in adult education. She was also a Sonori Plus participant several years ago and is a member of the INL US. So Rhonda, I know you've got a lot to share with us today, and so I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. All right, well, thank you so much, Diane and um, the INLS for inviting me to do this. Um, I'm always excited to share my passion. And um, for today, I'm going to um, cover travel and food photography. So. One of my favorite ways to get food is traveling and getting, um, you know, getting to know the culture through the food. So I have pictures from my Snorri trip that I've got in here. Um, we're going to go over some tips on how to find the best food when you travel, whether it's in Iceland or anywhere, it kind of follows the same rules. And then how to take some good photos of those food because um, most people love food porn. That's what I call it. So. Um, I'm going to start off, um, I'm going to bring up my little slideshow, a little death by PowerPoint. There's lots of photos in there, so it shouldn't be too painful. There we go. So, uh, beautiful Iceland. I love this. Perfect time of day to shoot a photo. It's called the golden hour in the evening time. So, um, I always joke around, I will travel for food. So, um, you may recognize uh, some of the street food there. Um, and we're going to cover some tips for finding the best eats whenever you travel. So one of the things I, I do immediately is I go on social media and I ask if anyone has been to some place and if they have any recommendations because truthfully, word of mouth is always the best places, right? You find out from a friend from a friend where to go. Um, and other ways you could book a food or booze tour. Um, many cities offer walking tours. And that's a great way to get variety and history. I did that in Greenwich Village in New York City, and I would have never have learned so much about it if I didn't do one of these little walking eating tours and you know, kind of helps keep those calories off too. And uh, the Snorri Plus program did a great job of making sure we got to eat all different things all over the places. Um, and then the other thing is eat street food. Um, and at small local neighborhood places, because it's always those little diners or the dives, right, um, that seem to have the best local food. And here we're actually, uh, we're at the greenhouse eating like the best tomato soup I ever had in my life. The other thing is taking a cooking class. So literally the day my husband Lonnie and I landed in Iceland, we threw our suitcases in our room and we ran over to Salt Eldis and we took a cooking class and it was fabulous. As a matter of fact, I got those recipes and when I came back here, I taught the same cooking class um, and shared it here. Um, you can see uh, 
we we had a lady from France and um, I forgot the somebody was from the middle um, uh, Czechoslovakia or something. Anyway, so I got to meet other people from uh, around the world in this cooking class, and I was also interested. And we just had a great great time. I highly highly recommend taking a cooking class. Plus, a cooking school instructor will also know the best places to eat. Hook up with a local, a friend, relative, friend of a friend, and have them act as your guide, or at least as an advisor. So uh, pictured here on the left, it's, her name is Yona, and her cousin lives in Great Falls. And so I know Chris at Voorhees, and so um, Yona came here to Great Falls, she taught a cooking class. When I went to Iceland, I had Yona take me to a grocery store. It was like, that was so much fun. I bought so much stuff and brought it home so I can recreate some of my dishes. And then over there is, um, the other photo is of my family. And uh, they, they did a nice little meal for me. And oh my gosh, that uh, they caught some fresh fish and just sliced it up. I, I made such a pig of myself. It was so, so good. <laughs> and let's see, um, renting a place with a kitchen. Um, you know, then you could just go grocery shopping, visit a farmer's market or other market, market and cook up local cuisine. So we went to like a food mall and um, went in a really nice shop that's at upper left corner. And then um, the other three photos are actually from the flea market. And we and I Reykjavik and we went shopping there. I actually had my first taste of the Harkel. And forgive me if I don't say anything correctly, um, but <laughs> yeah, that was positively awful, but you know, you had to experience it. <laughs> and it was super fun shopping um, and just seeing how things were, were different. We did rent a, a room with a kitchen, but uh, the Snorri Plus program actually kept us so busy that we never had time to cook. <laughs> That's great. You can certainly check guides, travel sites, blogs, or anything else that you can find. Um, you know, if you're really into like fine dining, James Beard winners, um, look at the world's best 50 mission star ratings. Um, you can watch popular travel TV shows um, that they'll can help you. You know, you have to be wary a little bit, you know, um, when you check things like Yelp and TripAdvisor and things like that. Um, because sometimes they pay people to put in ratings for their, their places. So they could be falsely high. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend a Nordic Culinary Conference um, at the Nordic Museum in Seattle. And they actually had Chef Gunnar from Dill, which is Iceland's only Michelin star restaurant. And so um, he got us reservations there. And uh, so we get to have a, it's my like only Michelin star restaurant I've ever been to. And that was pretty, it was pretty exciting. And we found this really cool. And I think I found it through Yelp, this little South American Icelandic tapas place. Um, and it was a fusion and it was bizarrely wonderful. <laughs> anyway, so you can use those as a guide, um, definitely for the little popular things. And just because something is popular, um, doesn't mean, or touristy, doesn't mean that it's not a good place to go to. I went to Blue Lagoon. You can't get more touristy than that. It is like, you know, Disneyland. Uh, <laughs> but did I love it? I still loved it. There's no good reason why tourists flock to a certain spot, right? So um, if you can put up with the wait times or, you know, all the hubbub that goes with the tourists, um, sometimes they are absolutely worth it. eat rural, so get out of the city and go to smaller towns to get a taste of true local food. Um, I really like to ask local people, salespeople, people at the hotel desk, um, I, I, taxi drivers are a really good source for good places to go eat. Um, I go to Vegas and I always ask the taxi drivers, where should I eat? Because they'll take me off the strip and to a good place to eat. Um, and here, you know, we went on the Snorri Plus program. We had lobster on the, on the shore. And then we went to uh, this little coffee bakery bookstore shop that a retired female rock band 
<laughs> Priscilla was running. Those are her pastries on the on the right. Um, and then, you know, a little farmhouse meal there, the block fisker and um, the rye bread. And then don't forget drinks. You know, if you if you like drinking, um, tour and sample local breweries. We actually went to a couple breweries, um, wineries and distilleries, if they, they have it. Um, this one on the left here, that is in that little food mall. Um, it's a brand new food mall at the time when we went. And it just opened up, so it was kind of the hip place to be. Uh, you can see it looks pretty trendy. And so it was very crowded, full of young people. Um, but I had a wonderful rhubarb cocktail there. And of course, my husband, he had his beer. <laughs> and then uh, finally, you could hire a travel agent that specializes in booking food tours. Um, it doesn't get easier than that, um, especially if you like go to Italy or France or something, you know, like places like that specialize in it. Um, now Cuba is a big place they do that. Um, you have to you know, you could be adventurous, but you do need to be careful. You need to know what you can handle. Um, I always travel with anti-diarrheal and Benadryl. I'm allergic to shellfish. <laughs> so um, it's a good idea to make sure you're prepared. Um, and then remember, it's a safe bet to stick with local foods. It's what they do best. So Lonnie and I had been um, in Iceland for maybe about eight days. And, you know, we're from Montana. We eat a lot of beef. So, uh, we were craving some good old red meat. Um, and then we were in um, Akiri, how do you say that? I don't know. Anyways, um, <laughs> you know where I'm talking about. Um, and we saw a steakhouse and we're like, yes, wow. We go in, we order the steak. Look at it, it looks beautiful, doesn't it? Absolutely fantastic. Oh, it was awful. <laughs> it was tough and chewy and, um, yeah, you know, uh, beef is not as common there. They, I asked them when they got the meat. It's shipped from Denmark. It's probably old milk cows that they turn into steaks and sell to Icelanders. So it was horrible. And I'm like, I should have just stuck with um, hot dogs and fish. <laughs> so lesson learned. So um, once you find all these good places, um, it's really nice to take photos of them. And in order to do that, um, you need to know a little bit about the basics of food photography. You know, it's not just as simple as pointing and shooting. So I'll run through them fairly quickly because this is not a full-fledged photography course, but just a few things to, um, like I have some pictures, I'll show examples of how to capture a nice picture of food. So composition is first and foremost. I always say beauty is easily seen, but to compose is an art. So you ever take a picture or something, you're like, oh my gosh, that's an amazing sunset, or this looks great, or that flower is so beautiful. And you take a picture of it, and then you look at your photo, and it's like, eh, it's just blah. So it's a lot of times it has to do with the composition. And there are rules of composition, and I say sort of, because once you know rules, you can break them. So first, when I'm doing a, a photo, I always think about um, what is the purpose of this photo? What is my story? Is it just gonna be something for me to remember, to sh share? Is it for me professionally? If it's something I, I what do I wanna communicate? What am I trying to express to somebody with this photo? And then that'll help you figure out what you're gonna do with your picture. So rule of thirds, and if you have even a, a cell phone camera, you can put this little grid on your camera and it's composed of nine equal parts. So it's all cut in thirds. And when you put anything in one of those PowerPoints, so that would be where these little dots are right here, it is going to dominate that photo. So if I were taking a portrait of somebody, their head would be here and their eyeball would be there. And it's gonna make you want to look at them. It's very compelling. Put that on your, it's an option in your settings on your phone and it will help you always get something in that PowerPoint area, that subject that you're looking for. As an example, back me for, um, you see where I've got the picture of the ship? It's on the one third. That was in the middle of the photo. It would look like cut the photo in half. 
And then I balanced that photo with the background here. And even this horizon is on the lower third, right? So if you put your sunset and you put the horizon in the middle, you cut the picture in the half, and it again is not so compelling. And you don't know why when you look at it, you're just like something doesn't feel right about it. Mother Nature does everything in odds. So when we photograph, we need to mimic that. And so that's by the rule of thirds. And then leading lines. So leading lines are the vertical and horizontal lines that, that well, the vertical and horizontal lines aid in the feeling of stability. And then wandering our diagonal lines give a sense of something diminishing. So here, horseback riding. And you can see how this line, it's taken you away. So you feel like when you look at this picture, you're also on that same journey as I am. And then this, same thing, your eye gets drawn out here with all that, and that's in, uh, I think, Hossos. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm getting a shake. Yes, that is. <laughs> so pay attention when you do your, your leading lines. Um, there's also symmetry and pattern. So we're surrounded by that, um, both natural and man-made. Now, here's like a famous little Lutheran church. And you can see how I've used by my perspective these stairs to lead you right up to that. And in this case, I photographed something that is centered, but sometimes you gotta break the rules. It looks really nicely centered because this is one, two, three, it's an odd number. So you get that same sense. You can see this is a sidewalk in Reykjavik. That was so pretty. Um, and then I just turned my camera at an angle. So I wasn't doing it straight on, which also made it interesting. And there's not much in this picture, but it's still a nice picture just because of the symmetry and the pattern to it. Do the same thing with your food photo. So how, how do we do this? Look at this. I have symmetry and pattern right here. But this looks very inviting. This was in the greenhouse when we were all having uh, the tomato soup. This is the tomato soup when I made it at home. Um, and I wanted to, to mimic it. Um, and you can see how I've used pattern. See the circle of the tablecloth is repeated here in the circle of the cup. But I have this in the one third portion, not in the middle. And then um, this is a leading line, right? These are leading lines bringing you into the photo and to the soup. Little tricks to keep this um, engaging and uh, interesting. Otherwise, it's just a cup of soup. You don't go, wow, look at that. That looks awesome. I wanna, wanna eat that. Another thing we can do is what they call triangulation. So here, see, got the geothermal activity. And I waited until they made this shape when I took that photo. Um, and it looks really, I like it. Um, but I did the same thing, and this is what I call organized chaos. Um, all these are put in a certain way, and I made, look at this little triangle right here. So it keeps your eye in the center of the photo. So you're interested. If I had just like a wiggly line, you would follow your, your eyes would follow that right out. Painters do the same thing, how they keep you engaged in that, that photo. Telling you my story. So a viewpoint. Um, sometimes taking an interesting viewpoint or doing it differently um, makes the photo engaging. Um, this is the, in Seattle, it is the library and it, it's a circle and you go up and around. And when you, when you get to the top, they have like a little lookout. And I made my husband hold my feet while I hung over <laughs> on top of that. <laughs> Whew, it could have been, could have, could have gone wrong. But this is, these are library bookcases and people looking at it. And that elevator is like the cool, I mean, the escalator is like the coolest escalator I have ever seen in my life. It's like a disco escalator. So I really liked the overhead view and all these little dots here, that is actually lights from above that are reflected down there. And when you're down on the floor, you don't even notice them. It wasn't until I got up above 
that I noticed how these were shaped, these little dots, and I just thought that was kind of cool. So did the viewpoint with some squid. You know, they are the ugliest things, but taking the picture of them from the top gives them texture and interest. Yeah, and I just snapped that with my, my, my phone. And here's another viewpoint. Now this, I got like down on the ground. So this rock was big and I thought, oh my gosh, I look like I'm on Mars, not in Iceland. So it's a, just changing your viewpoint can um, affect how you feel about a photo. So background, again, if you're just taking a picture just for you, um, just for your memories and you wanna know what it's about, um, you don't have to think about all these things. But if I'm taking this picture because I want everybody to know about this Viking beer, when you see this picture, well, you see my husband, you see he's holding a beer, but mostly you look at all the busy stuff in the background. Oh, football was on and there's other people in the bar and there's some words on here. And anyways, you're really not paying attention to what I want you to pay attention. So getting rid of that background, and I did this by, and just focusing in, now it is all about this glass of beer and not about Lonnie and his cool beard and um, the background, yeah. So depth is something to consider. Um, and this is also, we, we do all these things with our food photography. When you're taking a landscape photo, um, you wanna have something that's in the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. Photography is two dimensional. Real life is three dimensional. So to give your photo depth, you need to have something in the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. By doing that, that, that keeps, you can see the depth here, you know, like here it gives, this is far away, you can tell that. This is close up. You know, if I just took it from right here, it wouldn't, it, you wouldn't get as much depth out of it. So that's why I took it like portrait wise. And this one, I wanted to show how expanse it was. I still had the same things. I have something here in the foreground. I've got something here. And then we have the horizon back here and the beautiful sky. And this was done in, during that old golden hour. That's when the sun is setting or the sun is just rising. Most beautiful time to take photos. Cloudy days help too. Straight up sunny days for landscape are the worst possible times. And here I used it in food photography. So uh, pine needle syrup. And uh, you can see, well, when you make pine needle syrup, you're supposed to just use this bright little green bit of the, the pine tree that you pluck off when it first grows in spring. And so I, I emphasized that because this was for um, a recipe I posted. Um, and then here I'm featuring, this is my little can thing. And then that's, see how that background, you know it's there, but your eye is always gonna stay right here. You notice it, but you're focused on, on this part because the rest of it, so they call it, it drops off. You can do that with a phone if you have a phone that has a portrait setting. So I do a lot of my food photography in portrait settings. And then framing. So making your subject the center of attention. Um, this was a, a motorcycle museum. My husband and I both ride motorcycles. So we were surprised and excited to find this. Um, and he actually has a motorcycle painted the same way. This is a 2003 100th anniversary Harley Davidson, if anybody cares. Uh, and I took this photo and framed these on the side. So even though that's far away, you know that's the focus point. I did sort of the same thing with eggs here. I used this straw to frame it. And you can also see I used another technique called triangulation. So you can see the, the triangle um, and it keeps you centered on that. So cropping, um, if you take a photo and you don't like everything that's around it or you want the focus, you can take your, your, your picture and just crop it. Um, you know, now with digital, it makes it so easy. 
that to fix a photo. Though well, there's nothing wrong with this photo. Um, this is done for a magazine. And if you can imagine a line right here and this talk about, you know, cake, right? Wedding cakes, bridal cakes, whatever, a few little words, maybe the recipe. This is called copy space. Um, but I, if I'm not using it for that, I don't want all that negative space there. So you crop in. This is the same photo, right? Just cut in here, or you can move up close. Or if it's really not about the cake at all, and it's about how you could decorate a cake with flowers, especially if you can't like, frost, and do piping, you just buy flowers and put it on there, then that's really what it should be about, not about you know, the whole cake. And I'm a big fan of simplicity, like, Scandinavian simplicity. <laughs> so you can see, um, again, if you want somebody to focus on your food, you're in the restaurant, you got to take a picture, move the napkin away, move your wine glass away, get all that stuff out of the way and take the picture of the food. If that's what it's about. You know, it's not about the silverware and all that stuff. You can use those to help a little bit with leading lines and things like that. But Honestly, this is a pavlova and it looks amazing. Just, and I didn't have to do anything else, right? The food itself is gorgeous. That's Nutella on there. Mm. And this was the same thing. So this was at Salt Eldest where I took the uh, cooking classes at and I don't have anything else on there. There's nothing fancy. The food is beautiful and it's just on their wood cutting board and lots of natural light, beautiful, beautiful natural light there. Texture. So if you want to get texture from your food, you use what they call side lighting. And texture, this helps, helps give you feeling for the food. And this, um, this is a blueberry skier tart, which is on my blog if you want that recipe. Um, I think this is uh, ginger cookies that I've crushed up and made a crust with and then put skier on there and, oh yeah, anyways, so good <laughs> and beautiful. But by, by highlighting the texture, it gives the food a lot of depth, it makes it interesting. So if you're taking pictures, um, there are three different angles that we use basically in um, photographing. If you're gonna photograph something that is tall, you want to hit it straight on because that features the tallness of something, right? Um, if Because if you're overhead or looking down, it flattens it out. So uh, you can see here, I got a, uh, this is made locally here in Montana. Um, this is for my Viking mule, by the way. Um, I make with that pine needle syrup and uh, aqua bit. So um, I hit that straight on. I would also do that if I had a tall hamburger or you know another drink those are straight on shots if you um, have something on the flat side an overhead shot is really nice and um, it's very popular you almost can't go wrong with an overhead shot um, it's perfect to do in a restaurant because um, you can just hold your phone over it and and click and then you can see everything so this was in this was in iceland I just made that, but um, I like to do overhead shots quite a bit. And then the other angle is 45 degrees. So that would be like you are participating in this, or if you're sitting down at the table and you're ready to eat and you want it to look like a, you know, a meal, you do it at a 45 degree angle. That is the angle we have when we're sitting down and eating. So that will always be in an inviting angle. If it's for like, a pizza though, or a flat object, it's gonna look flatter. So I like to do, still do overhead um, a lot for the flat objects. So lighting, food that has, there's really just two ways that we, we get light in food photography, basically. Um, backlighting, so this is actually my studio and this is just a window and with a little sheer curtain on there and uh, there's a little wood box and I put these little lemonades on it and lit it from behind. 
and it looks light and summer and airy and refreshing and makes me really want to have a lemonade right now. And that was a very difficult shot. Every time I put a little piece of fruit in, my little ice cubes and my straws would pop the other direction. Oh, it was a battle. It took about six hours to get that shot. <laughs> and then backlighting during the golden hour. Um, this is in Iceland here. And um, you can see how it causes a silhouette, which in this case, I desired that effect. If I'm trying to take a picture of, um, you know, friends and family, and I want people to see their faces, you don't want the light behind you, right? Yeah, this golden hour time, isn't it gorgeous? How cute this little girl is, I just love it, she's following her dad. <laughs> so side lighting, that's what I talked about, where you get your textures from. Um, and this is very easy. This is the most common lighting. This is the lighting you will most likely use when you go to um, a restaurant. Yeah. Let's get some soup. Natural light will always be the best lighting. Um, when you have commercial lighting, um, you get either yellow lights, which adds sort of a yellowish tint, or um, if it's, you can get green tints to your food. So food just in itself looks better with natural lighting. And that's, this is all coming. This is actually sort of back inside lighting in the corner here. You can see where it's coming from. And again, just a window in my studio. Little fish cakes. So if you're using your phone and you're, you're out and about, um, try to sit near natural light or, I have no shame. I will get my food up, pick it up, and move it towards a window, and then take a picture. <laughs> so I get so I get good good lighting. I know people look at it like, oh, she's one of those weirdos. But here, this in a Loki Cafe, and oh my gosh, rye bread ice cream. Oh, it was so good. I would have never thought to do that. Loved it. Um, and then a coffee. But you can see where this light is coming off. You know, on the side there, and um, just. So really got lucky to sit there. Um, you can use, we talked about this earlier, use a portrait setting if your phone has it. So this is a uh, lacquer topper and uh, it's got the, the little chocolate covered licorice inside of it. Uh, and it's a meringue cookie. And uh, <clears throat> I'm, every year I do a Scandinavian cooking class. And this is one of the ones that, that we do. So, and you can just see how it gets light or, you know, a little fuzzy in the back. And that's that portrait setting. So sometimes you want to capture a moment. I was actually at this very famous chef's, um, he had a little reception and he had made all this food for us. And I was so excited and I wanted to capture a picture of it. Worst lighting ever. Um, this cake was actually amazing, but this photo is horrible. It's like, does not look good at all. And I'm trying to ca capture this picture because I'm gonna write a story about this um, trip I did in Kentucky. And uh, I was like, oh man, what am I gonna do? There's no good lighting. I mean, I didn't have all my camera stuff. So then the next shot, somebody was just getting a piece out of there and it looked amazingly better. So, you know, look, go back. That looks just like a messy cake thing, like somebody dropped the cake or whatever, I don't know. And then here, just that hand in it, and that looks inviting. Somebody's interacting, and it makes me want to have a piece of that cake too. It's like, oh, I hope you're cutting that for me. And I discussed this earlier, make sure you have purpose. Um, these photos, this was at, at Dill, um, and these, Photos were really strictly for me. And, um, you know, so it didn't really matter that these weren't perfectly arranged and, um, you know, the little charty bit is showing there. They smoked it on hay. They did some interesting stuff there. Or this is a pretty nice picture of Lonnie, but yeah, shiny his little forehead is. He wasn't really happy with it. He calls it his five head. <laughs> He's receded so far. 
<laughs> it's not a forehead anymore, but uh, uh, the light was right above his head, so <laughs> it shined. But I love the picture because it reminds me of when we ate at Dill, you know, a Michelin star restaurant. Well, that was a big deal. And then um, this is in that greenhouse. It also had terrible lighting. Can you see how yellow it is? Um, that is just from their, their regular light. There was no way, no window where we were at um, for, for eating. So um, I kind of just tried to not being rude, but walked around trying to get the shot I wanted. Um, sometimes I will rearrange shuffle backgrounds. Um, and then I definitely, you know, your phone has all these apps and filters that can take like that yellow away on your photos. You know, they call it a white balance adjustment. Um, and then I do, and if people are familiar with any photography, um, I export it and then I use something called Lightroom. Um, or you can use Photoshop and you can adjust colors. So that's what I did with this picture because I just couldn't get over all this bread they had. It was just incredible. So I did a little work. That is the exact same photo. So I cropped into it so we're closer to the bread. I changed the color. So I put what they call a, a matte filter over it. And then I put some fake sunlight in the upper right corner to, to lighten up. So it actually looks like we're outside. It's a greenhouse and it looks like we're outside. So I'm gonna go back one more time so you can see the difference. That was the original photo. Yellow, blah. I mean, the bread still looks pretty good, but I think, but you can see a lot of stuff you don't need to see. Upper left corner, somebody's hand holding a bowl, just sticking out there a little bit. Look like I chopped the ladies head off at the neck, you know. Um, and then you can see like a, one of their pipes for the geothermal stuff, the light behind those plants. And then there. So and that's actually, that actually got published, that, that picture. So um, yeah, you can do, you can do a lot. Um, sometimes you, as, as we say, you can polish a turd <laughs> and make it look good. And uh, that's what I did with, that's what I did in this case. So um, that's pretty much um, it. And uh, it's a lot of information and obviously not meant to teach you like how to become an expert food traveler, writer, or photographer, but it gives you some tips to practice when you go out. If you have more interest, um, there are, these, here are some available resources that I've used. Um, Creative Live is free, as long as you're watching it live, or you can actually buy um, stuff from them. Lynda.com is a subscription thing. There's a zillion things on YouTube. So you know, if you want to know more, you can do that. And then um, these are the books that I use and I've learned from. Mm -hmm. And we do have some questions. So um, uh, the first question is just thank you. This has just been a wonderful presentation. Um, I love that you love the grocery stores. I often want to be outside and like to pick up stuff at grocery stores and eat in a public square or natural locale. What grab and grow, grow grab and go grocery foods have uh, good memories for you in Iceland? Ah, well, definitely. <laughs> so uh, the dried fish, <laughs> um, I loved it, and um, I bought a ton of you know with just butter on it. Um, and we bought like three bags of it at the flea market. Um, and it was a mistake to buy it early on in the trip because for the rest of the next like 10 days, we were hauling stinky fish around with us everywhere. It, that stuff, there's no containing it. We had it triple quadrupled bag, zip, zipper locked. I mean, I just, you just couldn't, we ended up just putting it in a separate bag, like all by itself. But to, I loved eating it, <laughs> and um, I loved the um, the caviar and the tube, the smoked lamb. Yeah, those those were my favorite. Uh, well, I remember one of my first uh, trips to Iceland on the way home. Somebody had uh, bought some hard fisker and just had it in the overhead compartment, and it was a really really long flight because it yes. filled the whole plane with that uh, wonderful hard fisker smell. 
So we have another almost got kicked off of a plane because she was bringing some back. <laughs> we have a second question. Uh, what are some of the more unique Icelandic foods you were able to quote smuggle home? Uh, this person once brought back a, a small bottle of some great dry lamb seasoning, which was superb. Uh, but what have you found wonderful that you can't get in America? Oh gosh, um, some of the candies I brought back. Mm -hmm. uh, my Lonnie, he just loves licorice, so we really stocked up on some of the the licorice over there. And then, um, of course, like everybody else, I brought back lots of salt. Um, I love the, the salt, and I still special order um, the salt um, because it is far superior to any other salt I've ever I've ever used. Um, I smuggled back some seeds. I'm not supposed to do that <laughs> from the Angelica plants. <laughs> A good thing uh, they didn't really grow, <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm not in trouble. And um, I love there's this rhubarb liqueur, mm -hmm. and back. Uh, several bottles of that. Phew, it's a good thing we we're flying Delta and we had free like luggage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've brought back a bottle of that Uber liquor as well, and it's just wonderful. Uh, we have another uh, question that says, Hi Rhonda, great photos from our Snorri Plus program. This is from Patricia at Renicky. She oh, was yeah. on, the, on the trip with you. Yes. Did you ever get a workable brown bread recipe to use here in the States? I absolutely did. Um, I cook it all the time. Um, and uh, I, I got it from Salt Eldest. And, um, and then I made a few little mo modifications. And uh, it, it works fabulous. And I'm absolutely happy to share that. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. And so I hear that... Um, or I read somewhere that you do not use uh, anything other than natural light, uh, if at all possible in your uh, photography. So I'm wondering how long does it take you to get some of your photos? I, mean, I assume that you kind of hang out and do some tests or wait for the sun to be in the actual, actual perfect position. Um, so how long does it take you to do something like uh, well, you know, the lemonade one took like six hours to tell you that. <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, if, if it doesn't work out in my studio, my studio is in my house. Um, I have a south facing house and I will actually just come out here in my living room and I'll set it. So sometimes I will move where I photograph instead of waiting for the right moment, I'll move it. And if it's, if it's crunch time, I do have one LED light that is um, natural lighting. So um, I'll, I'll use that if I have to. Okay, all right. Well, I have learned a ton today. So thank you so much. This has been so entertaining and so informational. I really appreciate it, Rhonda. And I'm also quite hungry. So I think we might have to have you back to do a cooking show or something. <laughs> some, of that, some of that food looked really, really good. Um, it's, it's very obvious you have such a passion for your work. Um, it's, it's just really, really fun to have you uh, here, here with us today. Um, I do want to mention that the INLUS has a couple of uh, programs coming up uh, in October uh, on the 22nd. We will have a presentation by Patrick Stevens on the uh, Icelandic Fisk Collection uh, at the library at Cornell University. And uh, for, from about the middle of October through the end of November, we're really focusing on literature and books. So in early November, we will have a, uh, a presentation, uh, an author's corner by uh, Sverder Sigurdsson and his wife, Veronica Lee, on Svater's new book, uh, Viking Voyager, an Icelandic memoir. And then uh, later in November, we will have uh, a talk with Eric Newman, who uh, wrote Lundi, the Lost Puffin, and A.R. Hendrickson, a.k.a. Ms. Hen, who uh, is the author of Lara of the North. Uh, so it's never too late to start, or uh, it's never too early to start collecting some of those Christmas books. Uh, and I would also like to really thank uh, Doug Hansen. He is our vice president and treasurer at the INLUS, but he is also the person that makes all of this work. 
he uh, he takes care of all the aspects of recording and, and getting all the panelists set up and things like that, uh, as well as the, the post recording editing. So we would be really lost without him. So thank you very much, Doug. Um, and again, I just like to say thank you everyone for coming today. And uh, I hope to see you at one of our next upcoming events as well. Bye bye.